Okay, um, today we'll be talking about the human eye for this particular chapter. And uh, these are the things that you will need to know. So generally, you will need to know the, uh, the naming of, a, of how the human eye looks like from the frontal view and of course from the side view. Uh, that's one way. And of course, uh, for every of the structure, there will be the function or the special feature. Following that, you also need to know what are some of the uh, reflex action that is related to, uh, to the human eye. Uh, so there is two main one. One is called the pupil reflex and the other one is for focusing. So the pupil reflex mainly talk about how your pupil actually responds to situation during bright light or dim light. Whereas for focusing is how your, uh, some of the parts of your, the structures of the eye would adjust to ensure that you're able to view a far away object or a near object. So first step is, um, what are sense organs? So sense organs are basically organs that are able to actually receive information or in other words, are uh, able to receive some form of stimulus from the environment. This is aided by receptors, which are more or less uh, specialized cells on the organ itself to be able to detect such changes. And these organs uh, tend to be very, very specialized. Uh, so the eye in particular, is a sense organ in particular responsible for the sense of sight. So when we look at the frontal view of the human eye, what we can see is the cornea. The cornea is this um, shape over here in the middle that actually is a dome-like transparent layer that is able to reflect light into the eye. So when we talk about dome-like, uh, let's say we look at it from the side view. Uh, this becomes the dome shape. Yeah, of course I'm exaggerating, but in this case here, this is like a cornea. And how when light actually enters to the eye, depending on how it enters, you might actually have some bending of light. So sometimes it can bend far, far away or enlarge it so that eventually it becomes clearer at a later part. And of course you have the conjunctiva, which is this part over here. Is generally the white layer. So it's this um, membrane covering the scarlet and this helps to keep the front of the eyeball moist. Why is it, uh, why is it uh, intended to be moist? It's so as to reduce friction. Because at every few minutes or maybe seconds you tend to, uh, you tend to blink your eye. And if there isn't that form of um, moisture there, what will happen is your eyeball will actually be rubbing against the eyelid and then it may cause, and friction will cause wear and tear. So, uh, of course, it can generate heat and it can cause pain. Uh, the other one is, of course, your eyeball is actually fluid. It's able to move about and, of course, uh, left, right, and therefore, to aid in that movement, you want to reduce friction, hence the mucus. The pupil, on the other hand, is this white color, uh, this, this particular area here, the black, the black part. And in this case, it is the center of the iris. Uh, in what sense is basically it allows light to actually enter the eye. Okay, the iris is this uh, portion over here, the one that I mark out in green. And around here, there's actually two types of muscle, the circular muscles and the radial muscles, both of which are important to control the size of the pupil. Now, in, if let's say the pupil is the, it's like a hole for light to enter into your eye, right? Um, if you have too much, um, if you have shine with too much light, what will happen? The pupil will tend to want to close to prevent an excess amount of light entering into the human eye. As compared to, if let's say you go to a deep environment where you want to see more clearly, what will happen is the pupil will then become larger or increase in size to allow more light to enter so that uh, it can be detected by the human eye and you are able to see clearly. Then, of course, we have the eyelids. The eyelids help to protect the cornea from any form of mechanical damage. Mechanical means physical, like someone want to poke your eye or what. Um, generally, the first uh, natural reaction is you closing your eyes, in which the eyelid will shut it down to help to breathe. Have a physical protective layer of the human eye. Uh, squirting <coughs> tends to prevent any form of uh, excessive entry of light. And blinking will help to spread tears over the eye so that dust can be actually wiped off. 
your eyelashes helps to shield the eye from any dust particles. There's also the tear gland, which is over at this area. Generally, it is actually at the underside of your eyelid. Okay, what will happen? It is a gland that actually will secrete tears. These tears, they tend to have um, some form of antibodies to help to clean off any form of very primitive uh, bacteria. But more importantly, it helps to wash away any dust particles. It keeps the cornea moist so as to actually allow uh, the conjunctiva to be lubricated in order to reduce friction when the eyelids actually move. Now when we look at the side of the line, the, the side profile of the human eye and we cut it, uh, we see that the walls of the eyeball has three main layers. Okay, you have the disco, the coronia, and the retina. So these are the three main areas where the sclerotic coat is actually the outermost layer, the one in blue, followed by the cornea, which is the middle layer, and of course the retina, which is the inner layer. So if I were to draw it, it would be the arrow. This one. Okay. So when you look at the sclerotic coat, okay, what will happen is this is actually a tough white outer layer covering the whole eyeball and it's continuously with the cornea. So the eye muscles are attached to the layer to facilitate the movement of the eye. So even at the side, so let's say when you look at your eyeball from the front, okay, there is actually a few positions in which the the ligaments are actually, or the eye muscles are attached. One is at the top, bottom, and of course left and right. So in this case, uh, you're able to move your eyes from uh, side to side, depending on how they stretch. So let's say when the left, the, the left side actually stretch inwards and the right side stretch outwards, you tend to move your eyeball there, um, generally to the direction or to the left. And then of course top is, if it's a top stretch inside, and uh, the bottom right is stretched outside, then this is more or less relaxed. You pull the inside, your eyeball will be looking at the top. The cornea is a black pigment middle layer that helps to prevent the internal reflection of light. So for these particular things to uh, take place, what happened is um, it has to be black to prevent any form of internal reflection of light. Why? Because if you have too much total internal reflection of light, you can not see things clearly. It will be very, very um, uh, cloudy and uh, bright, and therefore you'll feel pain. So they want it to be totally black. Only The only thing that can reflect is actually generally your lens that helps to pull the light ray, focusing inside the internal retina. Okay. It also contains... Uh, blood vessels to carry about oxygen and nutrients to help to nourish the eyeball and to remove any metabolic waste from the eyeball. Now, what I saw this metabolic waste, it can be carbon dioxide because cells, they can undergo respiration. And uh, if, if it needs energy like the muscle cells or the muscles of the eye, you will undergo respiration to, under, to release the energy. And hence, the waste material is like maybe water or even carbon dioxide. The retina is this inner layer of the human eye and it contains light sensitive cells known as photoreceptors. So photoreceptors can be split into two main words, uh, photo and receptors. So the meaning of photo means in Latin is anything related to light, just like photosynthesis. Okay, uh, where photosynthesis men, they use light to synthesize something. So over here when they say photoreceptors, it's basically the receptors that are very sensitive to light and it's able to read off or output some form of information and there are two types of photoreceptors which are in your syllabus they are known as your rods and cones so the rods are basically photoreceptors that are responsible for you to see clearly at night and the cones um, are the ones that are res photoreceptors that are responsible to actually detect colorations of light so um, most colors are made up of three primary colors they are red, blue, and green, or in RGB. Uh, red, green, and blue. And so the mixture of this will actually allow you to see certain other colors or secondary colors. Um, so that comes in when it comes to uh, color blindness, uh, which we'll touch later on. Uh, in which, right, the color blindness might be due to 
the sensitivity or how some of these photoreceptors are able to detect or read light. Other ones would be the concentration. Okay. So um, contrary to what people think, like if you're colorblind means you cannot see anything. Uh, it's like one black patch. That's wrong. That's not colorblindness. You will still be able to see, you will still be able to outline the shape of the object. It's just that you will not be able to see its actual color. So it's like a faint shadow in some ways. So for cone, the three types are like red, blue, green, which we discussed, and then each of it contains different pigment. They absorb lights of different frequency. Uh, these three primary colors, they, they move in different wavelengths. And working together, you'll be able to see a variety of color in bright light. So for example, like this, um, the first one you can see is 74, but of course someone with a color deficiency of uh, green color, maybe for um, a lack of green photoreceptors, uh, what will happen is generally the whole um, I, uh, the person will not be able to mix up the, the shape or the number of it. So you, if they strain, they may still be able to uh, possibly see something, but generally it's quite hard. So the first one is 74, second is 42, and the last one is 6. Then comes the rods. So rods are generally stimulated uh, by very dim light, and they enable us to see in dim light. So the only thing is you can only see in two different colors in the black and white state. So black because of the shadow. And one so in imagine when you go to a dark room, right? The only thing you see is everything in black and white or some form of faint shadow. Um and what happens is sometimes you may suffer from something called night blindness. So night blindness is in a way your your inability to be able to see things at night lah, in which uh, everything is in total darkness and this is due to a pigment called the visual purple so visual purple is actually bleach uh, when exposed to bright light and impulses cannot be sent to the brain so in this case what are some materials you want to improve night blindness or you want to see better at night right you can take things that has high concentration of visual purple for example fisher. Next, another internal structure of the eye is this thing called the fovea, which is a yellow spot. So this yellow spot, right, is right directly behind the lens. And what the deep, small yellow depression helps is where all the images are focused on. And that is the position in which you'll be able to see things clearly. Like whether you need glasses or not depends on whether the image actually is able to rest sharply at this particular area. Okay, so it enables a person to actually have detailed vision in the light, uh, in the bright light. So in the event that because of your, of how the light actually curve it, right? So sometimes the sharpening point might be in front. And if it's in front, right, then you will see a general blur object or it might be too far back. So you, depending on where the positioning, you might be short-sighted or long sighted. Another thing is this thing called the blind spot. Blind spot is like what the name suggests you can't see that area. Why? Because that area right there isn't any form of photoreceptors. It is housed it is mainly housed to situate the optic nerve. So because of that it does not contain photoreceptors and therefore not able to detect any sensitivity or light. It cannot have any inputs and therefore you cannot see. The optic nerve tends to transmit information um, to the brain to be deciphered by the when the photoreceptors are generally stimulated. The brain will make sense of what you are looking at and then uh, reach out back to your other motor. So next we look at the lens. This lens is a transparent, circular and biconcave structure. Key word here is actually biconcave. Uh, if you write concave right you will see that the 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 the, the, the lens is actually only halfway through. Okay. Uh, but in this case, because it's bipolar, uh, bi convex, it is able to curve both sides. Okay. The shape and thickness can then be adjusted to reflect light onto the retina. The next thing is the suspensory ligament. So, suspensory ligament helps to attach the edge of the lens to the scenery body. And in this case, what is the the scenery body. The scenery body is actually this dotted area thing. These are actually muscles. 
It contains sinewy muscles that control the curvature and the thickness of the lens. Another thing to note is that the things pulling the lens with the sinewy body is actually a suspensory ligament. These are like rubbery, uh, rubbery attachment or uh, ligament to help pull and stretch the lens so that it's able to see things much clearly. Okay, of course, internal structure, you have the aqueous chamber. These are space between the lens and the cornea in which it helps to fill with aqueous humor, a transparent watery fluid. This aqueous humor helps to keep the front of the eyeball firm and reflects any light onto it, the pupil. So just imagine uh, inside the space of the eyeball, right? It's not an empty space where it's inflated. Generally, it has a form of liquid portion to help to keep the shape of the eyeball. The viscous chamber is this space behind the lens filled with another form of uh, viscous humors, a transparent jelly-like substance, and in this in totality helps to ensure the eyeball is actually firm and reflects light onto the retina. Okay, so we have gone through the first part of uh, the structure of the eye. Following this, we will be discussing on how the eye actually uh, works or co to control the light entering the lens, the eyes. So this is actually examinable, which you might be tested on the sequence and the motion. So you will need to memorize. So in this case, two main muscles are involved, uh, which is the circular muscles and the radial muscles. The word circular comes from the word being in a circle. Okay, so these are circular muscles. Okay, but then what about radial? Radial muscles come from the word the radius. So it is able to actually stretch the side. So that's the uh, meaning of radius. So together, right? Yeah, as muscles, they can either contract or relax. And when they, so imagine when you want to contract your circular, uh, when you want to contract your radial muscles, that means these radial muscles um, tend to pull. Okay, when they contract, they tend to pull towards the outer edge. You will see that the circular muscles tends to become bigger or wider, and therefore your size of the pupil will become larger. Whereas if your radial muscles relax, and your circular muscles contract, that means the circular uh, pieces, right, they tend to actually become smaller. So what will happen is when the circular muscles contract, you will see that the size of the pupil will actually decrease. Um, no two muscles will, no two circular or radial muscles will contract at the same time because they are antagonistic muscles, meaning they have, when one contract, the other must relax. If both contract at the same time, your eyeball will snap. So what happens when you are actually entering into an environment that is filled with uh, bright light or there is very high light intensity? First of all, circular muscles will contract and your radial muscles will relax. These two statements will constitute one mark in exam. Then the outcome will come in where the pupil will constrict and hence reduce the amount of light entering the eye. So this is the second one. So the opposite will happen. Constrict means it becomes smaller. Okay, next we look at the third one. Which, let's say it's dim light. Dim light means you want more light entering to your eye. So the circular muscles will first relax, radial muscles will contract, and finally this will cause the pupil to dilate and increasing the amount of light to enter the human eye. So dilate means like enlarging or to increase. But you have to use the word dilate. So all these are what we call pupil reflex because you can't consciously control it. That's why when you look at um, CSI or, or police, right, when they want to check whether a person is dead or a brain dead or what, they will shine a torchlight. And when they shine a torchlight, you're introducing more a very high light intensity into your eye. So naturally, your pupil, because you can't consciously control, will tend to close. But because your brain is dead already or you have died already, you are not able to perform any form of pupil reflex and hence uh, when you shine the eye your pupil will just stay at its original um, shape. So again pupil reflex is this response to changes in light intensity 
and this is so as to protect the eye from any form of excessive light exposure which could damage the retina. So sometimes um, never ever look at the sun, sun directly because that exposure can actually burn some of your photoreceptor and therefore it can be damaged. So for the pupil reflex, the reflex art of the pupil reflex is in this case where number one there's a stimulus. This stimulus is due to the change in light intensity. This change in light intensity will then lead will then be sent to the receptor on the retina via the light. Then from your retina, you will move on to the sensory neuron that is found in the optic nerve to transmit the information. This information is then relayed to the brain via the relay neuron. Then of course, the brain will decipher the information to you and then it will relay back to the motor neuron via the relay neuron. And lastly, the effector that house the, the iris muscle um, and the iris muscle that contains two main muscles, your circular and radial muscles. Okay. So, um, so the next section we will be talking about um, focusing um, accommodation of the human eye. So our eyeball, right, mimics very similarly like the camera where we actually take in light and from the light we try to decipher uh, the information by uh, flipping it so when we see the image on the eye how is it actually formed is that it gives an actually an upright uh, not so upright now um, position actually it's a uh, vertically inverted where let's say the knife is pointing upwards right when we look at it it's actually pointing downwards so what happened is uh, it's due this phenomenon is due to the reflection of the light wave so what then helps us to see things in the right way is the brain. Where the brain will actually receive such information and they will actually flip it back up for us. So that we are able to see. So the image on the retina either stimulates the rods, cones, depending on the intensity of the light. And based on this, you will be able to see it. Okay, so in terms of the image form, uh, image is different from what you are actually interpreting. Uh. So for the image form, number one, it is vertically inverted, meaning top is the arm, top is bottom, bottom is top. Laterally inverted means left is right, right is left. And definitely it is smaller <coughs> than the object itself. So in terms of the brain, firstly it helps to invert the image form on the retina. These light sensitive uh, cells are then stimulated and then the nerve impulses generated are transmitted through the optic nerve. So that's where your sensory neuron are uh, positioned in. The nerve impulses reach the optic center of the brain and the brain will then interpret the information and forms an upright image. The brain has a corrective function and this image is upside down within the retina, but the brain makes it upright. If the brain, if the blind has its sides reached out, right? The object will first appear upside down to him at first and later on the brain will have to relearn how to correct this image. So imagine someone who has never seen things before and then you plant some camera inside your brain. What will, I mean in the eye, what will happen is when they receive, right, it's actually an inverted image. So what will happen is this information will have to be reprocessed and the brain to flip it back up for us to see, to understand. Next is the second important one which is uh, focusing. So for focusing, in a typical exam question, they will ask things like, oh, uh, a bird is flying towards you. What is the change happening in your human eye? So that is focusing to a nearby object. If not, if it's a far object, it can be you throwing a ball away from you, or a plane flying away from you, or a bird flying away from you, or a car traveling further away from you. So the lens on the human eye can be adjusted so that images of objects of different distances are actually being formed on the retina. Other, another word for focusing is called accommodation. Okay, and in focusing, the curvature of the thickness, all the thickness, of the lens is usually adjusted, allowing light rays to be focused on the retina. So when we look at this, the focusing on object at different distance, for a near object, we'll see that the scenery muscles tends to relax, making the lens more compact. On the other hand, for a far vision, the scenery muscles will contract, making the lens actually a lot thinner. 
So how are we going to go about focusing on nearby objects? Number one, the scenery body. The muscles must actually first contract and hence relaxing their pull on the suspensory ligament. Secondly, the suspensory ligament will also slacken and hence releasing the pull on the lens. So what will happen is you can see, uh, first your, your scenery muscles, right, not the circular muscles, uh, will tend to actually contract and they move towards each other. This will then slacken the pull of your suspensory ligament. Hence, when there's no more pull, these lens will tend to become thicker because they tend to be an oval shape. They, in which we call it, they are becoming more convex. And this will then lead the focal length to decrease, bringing the object nearer. The light rays are then sharply focused onto the retina, stimulating the photoreceptors, where the nerve impulses will produce uh, will be produced and transmitted via the optic nerve to the brain. This brain will interpret the image form and therefore the person is able to see the object. On the other hand, when we are looking at the distance object, everything is of the opposite. First is the scenery board. The scenery muscles will tend to relax and hence when they relax, they tend to pull further away from each other. This will then make the suspensory ligament to be to be taut, that means tightened. And in this case, this will cause the pulling of the, of the lens. When the lens becomes thinner and less convex, this will increase the focal length. That means you want to focus from a far object kind of thing. And therefore, the same repeated story will come in. The lights will then be sharply focused on the retina, stimulating a photoreceptor. The nerve impulses generated are then transmitted to the brain via the optic nerve. The brain will interpret these impulses and the person will then be able to see the distance object. Okay, so let's say a student is reading under a shady uh, tree and, uh, and then when she was reading, she looks up at the plane in the sky. Describe what will usually happen to her eye to allow her to see some uh, the plane. So you can see uh, now you're starting from a near object then slowly you are reaching out to a far object, which is the plane. So in this case, how I will narrate is I will first write down when the girl is actually reading uh, the book, if the object is near. And because the object is near, the scenery muscles will contract and everything onwards. Then later on, when we talk about focusing on a, uh, the plane, then the person will have the scenery muscles will relax, pulling onto the scenery, suspensory ligament and the rest will follow as well. So these are some of the stories in order to write the four marks. So the four mark is two marks is under the near object, two marks is under the far object. Okay. So that is all for this chapter. This is actually a relatively short chapter. You can uh, pause the video and recap some of the 